Um, sunscreen and EMFs are like the two third rail topics. Yeah. Um, so glad you brought that up. Yeah. Here's what we know. There are compounds that exist in commercial products, not just sunscreen, that can cross the blood brain barrier and that are bad for neurons, period. No, that is indisputable. Some of those compounds have been shown to be in abundance in certain sunscreens and co other cosmetics. So I'm not saying that all sunscreen are bad. I'm saying that there are some sunscreens that contain some things that were they to get across the blood brain barrier would be bad. You what know, are those things? Um, these are these are small molecules that can cross the blood barrier into neurons and that can cause neurodegenerative like conditions. What right? things? Um, well, these are typically associated with triclosans and some of the other things that are shown to be in certain detergents and soaps. Like their their detergents and soaps that are now off market because they contain some of these very small molecules related to triclosan triclosans and related products. But there are healthy. There are safe sunscreens. There's no question. Like what's a good safe sunscreen? Uh, so there we get into brand names. I, that's a tricky one. I don't want to get too outside my wheelhouse. I'm researching this for a future episode. This okay. is really a place where I want to okay. I want to tread carefully. Here's okay. what I think is important for people to know. Not all sunscreens are safe. Not all cosmetic lotions are safe. Not all cosmetics are safe. I think we're probably going to arrive in a place not that different from the silicone breast implant kind of landscape where it turns out, depended on what implant and how long they were in and you know what they were packaged in like so many things like tryptophan the amino acid that was people used to enhance sleep now you get it readily but it was banned for a long time because a few people actually took tryptophan that had contaminated binders it was the stuff that was in there with it and they got very sick and, and there were some fatalities even mm -hmm. and so it was taken off market for years for all the wrong reasons i mean taken off for good reason but it was the binders not the tryptophan with sunscreen, there are many things that are good about sunscreen, like avoiding skin cancer, but many sunscreens are bringing in these triclosans and other small, you know, if a molecule is small enough, it'll cross into the blood brain barrier. And we don't know what the long-term effects of those are, but I think it's worth paying attention to. Similarly, and I used to teach this in a big undergraduate course. If you look at the data on EMFs and you look at the data on cell phones, you will find animal studies that show that if you put a cell phone under a rat's cage or a litter of rat's cages. And two separate studies, you'll find dramatic decreases in testosterone in some studies, and you'll find subtle increases in testosterone in others. I don't know what the effect is or how it's working, but clearly there needs to be an exploration of this. And clearly it's going to be a really inconvenient thing to do that, right? I mean, I use the earbuds. I, I use the earbuds, but nowadays I sort of wonder, should I maybe use the wire things more? You I've know? been using the wired ones more. Yeah. Yeah, because I'm, I'm chicken shit. I'm hearing things. Well, but I don't know what's real. People like start freaking out about EMFs. I'm not sure if they're right or if they're tinfoil hat in it. Yeah, and I'm in the same boat. And I'm sure that some of my colleagues, you know, the moment we say, you know, EMFs and sunscreen, people are going to freak out. And yet, I will go on record saying that some of the very scientists who say, oh, like, don't even worry about this, they're some of the most unhealthy looking people That's I've ever seen. Issue. Yeah. You know, a... so they're not really incentivized to get it right, nor am I a conspiracy theorist. But here's my wish is that we look at everything and we look at it objectively and that we take into account that there are some animal data that point to the fact that getting these EMFs in close proximity all the time might might not be the best idea. There's certainly some kind of an effect. It depends on the individual and the dose and a lot of stuff, but that, what you're saying about scientists is, a, is an issue as well. There, there are certain people that they're talking about things that affect your health and they're clearly unhealthy. It's like, boy, that's a hard pill to swallow coming from you. Well, and I think, you know, we go back to Liver King and some of the other more uh, colorful aspects of online nutrition and health information. Yeah. People wonder, I actually saw some, I made the huge mistake of going onto Twitter in the last couple of years. I never really was on Twitter and it's such a weird landscape as you know. But one of the things I discovered was that a lot of the people in the science and medical community are there kind of poking fun at online health and nutrition. And they wonder why. They're sort of like, how is it that this person has millions of followers and so on? And the reason is actually because they're doing such a poor job of communicating health information in a meaningful, clear, and like actionable way. And so it provides this enormous opportunity for someone to just show up and kind of just say whatever and grab a huge, huge audience. But well, let me push back against that because they're just, how would someone who's a legitimate professor 
make some kind of an impact online. Come on my podcast. But that's maybe <laughs> the only way. Like you'd have to find an established portal sure. or create your own. And that's a long, laborious task of building up an audience and providing them with good content and hopefully getting on a podcast where people like have a, a, a large audience and an appetite for that kind of a thing. Or, or but, I mean, or more realistically, go on your podcast. I mean, that's what I was saying. I mean, really. yeah. I mean, I think yeah. that what you know, what you do and to some extent what I do, what Lex does, and then of course there are others, is, you know, try and provide a venue for people that would otherwise be locked away in their laboratories or locked away in their clinics yes. to get information out there and to have someone across the table for them like this, you know, kind of pushing and, you know, saying, but tell me more, like right. what, what exactly, what do we know, what don't we know, mice or humans, you know, like how many people, this kind of thing. Because in the absence of that, I really think that people are just left to kind of there's a kind of gravitational pull towards the thing that's most sensational. 